Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome today to Lake Forest Church. It is great to be here with you. Why don't we stand our feet together this morning as we get ready to get started? I hope that you are able to rest this morning in this truth, wherever you are, that God is good, that you can depend and stand on his promises. Let's worship him together in spirit and in truth this morning. Will you sing this with us? Now raise it, hallelujah, in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise it, hallelujah, oh, louder than the unbelief. I'll raise it, hallelujah.
before I spoke a word, and you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good to me. Yes, I have. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. been so, so kind to me.
Father, because of your great love, you relentlessly pursue us with a grace and a fervor we do not deserve. It's because of your immense mercy that we stand here today as your children, seeking desperately to worship you because of your goodness and how wonderful your might is. Lord, we ask today that you would open our hearts and our ears to hear the truths of your word and then to hold that truth in our heart as we leave this place and shine your light in a very, very dark world. Give us the grace and the strength to withstand anything that may come our way that we may show that you are the only one worthy of praise. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, my name is Kip, and I'm on staff here at Lake Forest with Remix, our youth ministry. Yeah. Sweet. We have fans of, of Remix out here. Um, so actually, we're going to be sharing after Easter ways that you guys can make a lifelong impact by being Remix leaders for the kids, which is super exciting, so stay tuned for that. Also, uh, as a church, we would love to pray for you. So on your seats, there are prayer cards. You guys can fill those out. And then out these doors right here in the back, there are treasure boxes that you guys can drop those in. Or if you prefer to do it online, you can email us at prayer at lakeforest.org. Um, also, with those treasure boxes that are out back, you guys can put um, tithes and offerings in those boxes. Or if you prefer to do that online, um, there's a link that we have on the screen right here, lakeforest.org slash give. You can give through that link. Um, so we're really excited because Easter is just two weeks away, and I can't wait to... Is that somebody? You hear that? Uh, do you hear that? Do you hear that? Sir, excuse me? Sir, 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 sir. Oh my gosh. We're, do, we're doing something here. Do you clearly? See? Yeah. Hey, listen. Who are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? Who, who am I? Are you kidding me? My name is Chaps McGee. I am the world renowned egg hunter. I'm so excited because Easter's coming. Easter's when there's eggs everywhere. Chaps McGee? Chaps McGee. McGee, he, e, McGee, how many E's is in your last name? One, one E. Okay, All right. good to know, good to know, so, Chaps. Do you smell that? I smell you. Do you, oh. you smell that? I, I smell an egg. I smell one. An I egg? I smell one. An egg? Hold Where? on, hold on. Eureka! That's not it. Eureka! Are you looking for eggs right now? Are there eggs around here? Bingo! <laughs> what? <laughs> Let's see what kind of candy it has in. What in tarnation? Easter services. Huh. That's not edible. That's interesting, because I have that actually right here, chap. So that brings me to the next mm. point, which is good to know that you have those random eggs. Uh, on Easter worship, which is coming up in two weeks, we'll have a Saturday night service, a Sunday morning service, and those are going to be outside as well as hosted online. That was unusually helpful, chaps. I don't know how you... I'm picking something up here. What is I'm that? I'm picking some... the Egg Finder 2000. <laughs> shush, shush. So, shush it. So sorry. Bingo. <laughs> Lucky. Yeah, baby. <laughs> uh, let's see what kind of... Found that right there? Uh, how did you find that? Egg and roll. Egg and roll. Oh, egg wow. Egg roll. That makes me hungry. We actually are having something called the egg and roll, um, where you're going to get your house egged. So tomorrow is the final day to sign up for that if you want your house to get egged. Thank it you sure again, is. Chaps, for the unusual help. That hold you on. I'm using telekinesis. Hold, hold on a second. Bingo. <laughs> I got one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there she blows. Oh, my God. There she blows. See, you didn't even know. You're not a professional. Oh, my gosh. Where did Let's you see what find kind of candy. No candy. These are the biggest bummer eggs I've ever found. Grocery boxes for neighbors. 
So we're actually going to start collecting grocery boxes for neighbors next Sunday. And if you want any details on Easter, you can go to lakeforest.org slash LFCH Easter. <laughs> okay. Um, my ticker. My ticker. Tabs. Ah, Tabs. Ah, Are you okay? Yeah. Ah, ah, I feel one in my heart. There's an egg. Oh, my god. I feel it in my heart. I thought you were dying, chaps. I almost was. Bingo. <laughs> Look at here. Got to pull my britches up. What Two this? services. These are the lamest eggs I've ever found. I don't think that's lame, actually, chaps. That's really cool to hear because that's the next point that I had on this paper, actually. You, you know which... what? Egg Finder 2000 says there's some more eggs. I'm out of here. These eggs are All bummers. Right. Thanks, chaps. See you later. Well, chaps, I'm glad that you said that. We are really excited as a church to announce that we're returning back to two services. So on Easter Sunday, yeah, really excited. On Easter Sunday, we will be having a 9.30 and an 11.05 a.m. service. Those will also be online. And then the weeks following that, we will also be having those 9.30 and 11.05 services. Um, but just so you know, Kidtropolis or Children's Ministry will only be during the 9.30 service. So now after Chaps McGee and all of that, uh, let's take a look back at last week's chapter of the whole story. So I have here a plate of fresh baked Toll House chocolate chip cookies, baked 10 minutes ago, still warm. Who loves Toll House chocolate chip cookies? Okay, you're not acting like you love. Who really loves these? Show your hand. Okay, you love them? Okay, I'm going to make a promise to you right here, okay? This whole plate of cookies is yours. I'm going to give this whole plate of COVID-free cookies <laughs> to you, okay? Now, here's the deal. You're going to get this whole plate of cookies. In fact, you're going to get this whole plate of cookies in two minutes, okay? In just two minutes if no one in this room makes a sound from this point forward. Who was that? Wow. You're not going to get this plate of cookies in two minutes because of the poor decision of someone else who was not staged but happens to be my daughter-in-law. I'm thinking she thought if she made a noise, she'd get this. But here's the deal. I made a promise to you. You're going to get these, just not in two minutes, because of someone's poor decision. So they're going to sit right here. Good morning. My name is Mitch. It's good to be with you, but I'm not gotten to meet you. And I am the executive pastor here at Lake Forest Church. And I want to ask you to ponder something with me this morning. When have you paid the price for someone else's poor decision? Has there been a time in your life when you did all you were supposed to do, but because of someone else not doing what they needed to do, you paid the price? 
We're going to grapple with that today as we continue through this whole story, our walk this year in 2021 through the entire Bible. I'm so excited about the number of you who are reading with us. If you've not jumped in, now's a great time to jump in. But we're going to continue this story, and so let me just catch you up where we are. If you've not read, you can jump in. If you have, this is just to keep us on the same page. But God's people, the Israelites, they've been in slavery to Egypt for a number of years, but God just sent Moses to deliver them out of slavery. And now they're in an area, in a wilderness, that they're getting ready to go into a land that God promised to them. And so they're about to enter into this promised land. They've come out of a land that, of Egypt where the laws there were enforced by a guy named Pharaoh. And so they're underneath the Pharaoh's laws. But what we looked at last week is God is now entering in new laws because God is now king. Pharaoh's no longer king, but God is, and so he's giving these new laws, he's establishing these laws, and last week we looked at three different types of laws. The first one, we looked at the Ten Commandments specifically, these are moral laws. We also looked at civil laws that were specifically for the people of Israel. Okay, and then there were ceremonial laws, which is the book of Leviticus, which are laws that they are to perform, the priests are to perform, in order to keep the relationship with God and the people right. Now, when Jesus came in the New Testament and died, he fulfilled all of those ceremonial laws, and so we're not bound by those any longer. But now God is giving, though, all of these laws because he's saying to the people, you are a people that I need to live in a certain way, and here are the laws in which you need to do that. They're now out of Egypt. They're multiplying. They're increasing in number, just as God has said he would do for them. And they're almost ready to move into this promised land. And as they're about to move into the promised land, God wants to first kind of know, okay, how many of them are there? How many of you are there? And so he says to Moses, I want you to get of a count. I want you to count. And so he takes and he counts in uh, Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. He says to Moses, take a count of everyone 20 years or older. Now, it's important, it's important to understand why 20 years or older and why they're making a count. Here's why I want you to understand that's going on here. One is you're going to see in two different places in the book of Numbers where God calls Moses to take a census, to take a count. That's why the book of Numbers is called the book of Numbers, because it is a place where God's taking count. There's some reasons why he's doing that. First, is back at Adam and Eve, he tells Adam and Eve this thing. He says to command to them, be fruitful, multiply, increase in number, and and fill the earth with my image. He then goes on after the flood, he tells uh, Noah and his family after they come off the boat the same thing. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with my image. Now, what ends up happening in those two incidents is mankind ends up sinning and falling apart on that, prom- on that uh, command. And so then in uh, chapter 12 of Genesis, Abraham comes along, and God makes a promise to Abraham. No longer is this a command to you, but Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you fruitful. I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to increase you in number, and all of the world is going to be blessed by your seed. And so part of what you're seeing in the book of Numbers is you're seeing stories of God fulfilling his promise. I told you I'd multiply you. I told you I'd increase you in number. And let me show you how well we've done in this. God is still on the same mission he's always had, to make the people fruitful, to multiply them, because he's on this mission to fill the earth with his image. So as you enter the book of Numbers... God's increased the number of Israelites, he's established the laws, and now he's putting everything in place in order to move them to the next step of taking the promised land. Numbers chapter 13 is where we're going to pick up the story. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, send out men for yourselves to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. Now, you have to catch something. You have to hold on to this because here's the promise from God. I'm going to give the sons of Israel this land. This is the land that I'm going to give the sons of Israel. 
hold on to that promise because this is the promise that God made to Israel, Abraham's grandson. He made it to Abraham. He made it to his son, made it to his grandson. And he says, some generation I'm going to give this land to. Abraham sends the 12 spies to the land. And here's a list of those men. These were the names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, the son of Zakor. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Rupa. From the tribe of Zebulun. If you don't know how to speak Hebrew names, just say them really fast and nobody will know. Gadiel, the son of Zodi. From the tribe of Joseph. And he goes on and he goes on and he gives the names of all 12 spies. Now, I know that everybody who's listening to this sermon, who is here, who's at home, I know that all of us haven't spent a lot of time in the Bible. In fact, uh, those of you who've spent a ton of time in the Bible, I can assure you, those of you who spend a ton of time in the Bible, you don't know the names of 10 of these 12 spies. How many of you know the name Caleb or know somebody named Caleb? Okay. How many of you know the name Joshua or know somebody named Joshua? Now, in verse 16, you actually see that Moses didn't even write the name Hosea. Hosea, it tells you in verse 16 that Moses started calling Hosea Joshua, and that's where you get that name. Now, how many of you know somebody or have a kid named Palti? Egal. Gadiel? Nabi? So none of us know the names except for these two, Caleb and Joshua. And there's a significant reason why you know these two names, and you're going to see this in a little bit. Moses sends all 12 of these into the land. He says, tell me what the produce is like. Tell me what the people are like. Are they small? Are they big? Tell me what the cities are like. Are they huge? Are they fortified? Or are they just kind of stumbling around? Come back. Tell me what it's about. So they go into the land. They see the people. They're amazed by the fruit. In fact, they cut off a branch of some of the grapes and bring it back because they want the people to see you're never going to believe how huge the grapes are in this land. Verse 25, when they returned from spying out the land at the end of the 40 days, they went on and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregations of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation. They showed them the fruit of the land. So they reported to him and said, hey, Moses, we came into the land where you sent us. It certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land, Moses, they're strong. The cities, they're fortified. They're very large. And indeed, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites are living in the hill country. The Canaanites, they're living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Moses, this beautiful land. It's just like God said it was. It is rich. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's got rich soil. But here's the deal. This is what else we saw. There are some people, they are settled. They are fortified. They are together, and they're huge, and they're strong. There's no way that we can take this land. You got to trust us, Moses. I know what God has said, but you got to trust what we saw. And here's where we see the repeated sin throughout the Bible. Trusting what you see more than trusting God's Word. It's so easy, isn't it? To hear God's guidance for us to say, trust me, you got to trust my Word. I've been in this. I know what's going to happen. You got to trust me. You got to follow me. In reality, we want to, yet we look at circumstances and go, I just don't see how that can play out, God. And so we make a decision to trust what we see more than God's word. And I believe it's true for all of us because we can think that we're immune from that. But the daily ask of us is, are you going to trust my word? 
or are you going to trust what you see? Well, there's one spy in the story that refused to do that. Listen to the words of Caleb. Verse 30, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses, and he said, we should by all means go up and take possession of this land. We will certainly prevail over it. People of God, listen to me. Don't listen to these other spies. Of course we should go up and take this land because God has promised it. We'd be foolish to not. I saw what they saw. I saw that the cities were big. I saw that the people were huge. I saw they were strong. But I promise you God will deliver us because that's what God has said. Verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against these people. They're too strong for us. Joshua then jumps in with Caleb, and it puts Moses in this predicament. As a leader of people, he's in this predicament. I've got two people saying, let's go, and I've got ten people who say, there's no way. And even if you've heard the word of God, when you've got the majority of the people around you saying no, you are tempted to listen to them as opposed to God's word. And that's where Moses is. Verse 14, all the congregation raised, chapter 14, verse 1, all the congregation raised their voices and cried out. The people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The entire congregation said to them, if only we died in the land of Egypt. Or even if we died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives, our little ones, they're going to become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, okay, let's appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Wow. What an uprising. We can't do this, Moses. Why would you bring us here? Why would God bring us here? Why would he take us in the land in order to just die by the sword? They're so convinced this is a bad idea that they say, we're going to overthrow Moses, we're going to find another leader, and we're going back to Egypt. We're going to go back into slavery. The story's getting good. But then Caleb and Joshua jump in. Verse 6, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land. He will give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Don't fear those people of the land, for they'll be our prey. Their protection is gone from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. These are passionate men about this. They're so passionate, they, they rip their clothes. Now, I'm thinking that during that time, that was a way of, of just making your point. But I'm assuming it got too expensive, and so we went to pounding our fist and pointing our fingers. But they're trying to say, guys, you've got to listen to us. This land is right. But the bigger thing is we cannot rebel against the Lord. Not again. You see, this isn't the first time. And they're pleading with these people, let's don't rebel against God again. I know what you see, but listen to God's word. But fear kicks in because of what they saw. To the point that now they plan after Caleb and Joshua stand up there, they're planning to stone Caleb and Joshua. But the Lord intervenes. He keeps them from doing this. And here are the words that God says to Moses. Certainly all the people who have seen my glory and my sons, which are performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test ten times, and they've not listened to my voice. Shall by no means any of them see the land, which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who are disrespectful to me see it. But for my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit, he's followed me fully. I'll bring him into the land which he entered, 
and his descendants shall take possession of it. Ten times. Ten times they've said, we're not going to trust the Lord. And God has been very patient. They've seen me deliver them out of Egypt. They've seen me divide waters and carry them through. They've seen me conquer the Egyptian soldiers. They've seen me take care of them, and yet they still don't trust my word. Well, not this time. Not this time will I watch over them. Only Caleb, because of his spirit, will enter into this land. He goes on, verse 28, just listen to the words of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord, just as you've spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. Your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness. All your numbered men, according to your complete number, from 20 years old and upward, that have grumbled against me, by no means will come into this land where I swore to settle you. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Your children, however, those who you said would become plunder, I'll bring them in, and they will know the land which you've rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness. God is tired of them not listening and trusting his word. Caleb and Joshua, the kids that you said would plunder, they'll get this, but no one over the age of 20, the ones that I got you to do a census with, the counting of, no one over age 20, none of them will ever go into this land. Now remember the promise of God was to give this land to the people of Israel, to the sons of Israel. He offered it to this generation, but they refused it. And so he'll keep his promise, and he'll give it to the next generation. And here's what's critical. They got what they wanted, but they didn't get what God had in store for them. When you trust what you see, you get what you want. But you will lose what God wants for you. See, another reason why counting the people was important, Moses took a census of everyone 20 and over because this is the people that God said, you won't see this land. And it took 40 years in order for that whole generation to die off. And so at the end of the 40 years, once they die off, God says, I'll give it to the next generation. I want us to pause and just reflect on the story right here. Because it's easy to look at these folks and kind of say, what boneheads? I mean, I'd trust the Lord if he gave me ten chances. Really? Where have you trusted what you see over God's word? And you've missed out on what God has best for you. Where have you manipulated your finances? Because you just couldn't see how God would provide for you and you didn't do the right thing and you're now paying the price for it. Where have you relationally been unfaithful because you just didn't see how God's plan would satisfy you and so you're now paying the price in your relationships. Where are you choosing or or you did choose a while back to not trust God's plan for sex and that it would be shared between a man and a woman in the sanctity of marriage, and now you and you or your spouse, you're missing out on God's best. See, I can know that you can feel like you blew it, and sometimes, though, we have to be honest. I did blow it. We have to be honest about the Israelites. They blew it. They had an opportunity to trust God's word, but they trust what they saw instead, and they blew it, and they missed out on what God had best for them. God gave them exactly what they wanted to not enter the promised land. And instead, they got what they were asking for. They spent 40 years wandering in a wilderness. So where are you tempted today to put your trust in what you see instead of following what you know God is saying to you? I told you in a sermon a few weeks ago that the pattern in the Bible is sin, judgment, and grace. Their sin, they trusted what they saw about this land instead of trusting God's word. The judgment, he gave them what they wanted, 40 years in the wilderness. But whenever you see judgment, folks, whenever you see judgment, 
grace is right around the corner. And so the grace is that they spent 40 years in the wilderness, but God was with them. God could have said, fine, spend 40 years out here all by yourself. I'll be back in 40 years to take Caleb and Joshua into the promised land, but I'm not coming back until all of you die. No, instead, God said, okay, you're not getting the best, but I'm not leaving you. I'm right here with you. And you read in the book of Numbers all the miraculous ways that God is providing for them even when they're in the wilderness. And I find hope in that because I know for me, I know for all of us, there are places that we have not taken God's word and we've settled for second best. And the grace is that God is still with us. Nothing you ever do removes the Lord from you. But he's calling us to trust him. So this is where we are in our story. The Israelites are now going to spend 40 years in the desert because they didn't trust God's word. And that's horrible. But there's a worse part of this story that I think a lot of times we miss. Here's something else. As bad as that sounds, here's something that's even harder for me to wrestle with. Caleb and Joshua. Caleb, the one that did the right thing. Caleb trusted God. Caleb had faith in God. Caleb and Joshua stood up and said, trust the Lord. Yet because of the decisions of other people, they have to now spend 40 years in the desert with these people. That's horrible. I find this really interesting because as I was preparing for this sermon, uh, Wednesday night I had a few of my neighbors come over. We were throwing some darts, and one of them got there a little earlier before the others, and he was frustrated. He's just telling me what he's frustrated about, and he said, then it came to the end. He was mad. He said, Mitch, I just don't get it. Why is it that when you do the right thing, you try to live well, you try to plan well, yet in the end, you're the one who gets punished? And I went on to tell him the story of Caleb and Joshua and thank them for writing my sermon this week. Why is it that even if you try to honor and follow the Lord, you may find yourself in the wilderness? You see, I know there's a lot of teaching out there around if you just trust the Lord, he's going to bless you. If you watch him and you follow his ways, that all the good things are going to happen. He's going to just make you rich and all of this and all these wonderful things. Well, folks, I don't know about you. That's not my life. And I don't see this in Caleb and Joshua's life. And I find too many times that when I'm following the Lord and when you're following the Lord, that not everything goes well. Now, I believe the Lord gives us everything we need. Mainly, he gives himself. But it doesn't look all the time like we thought. So I have to ask you, who's stolen your dream? Who's stolen your goal? Who's stolen your desires? even when you were doing the right thing and the things that God asked you to do? Was it a spouse that wanted the divorce that you didn't want? Was it a job that got ripped right out from under you, even though you were trying to be, uh, live with integrity? Was it a pandemic that put a halt to all your dreams and plans? Was it a dream trip that just doesn't look like it's going to come together because of COVID? Yeah, that one's personal. Was it a child's poor decision that robbed you as a parent of your hopes for them and your hopes for the next years of your life? But those seem ruined because of their poor decision. Is it an ex-spouse that's continuing to never be on board with what you hope will happen with your kids? No matter how much you try to do the right thing, they're going to do the opposite. Even though you're trying to do the right thing, who's stolen your dreams and your desires? Well, that's Caleb and Joshua. Here's what makes it even worse. It's bad enough they got to be in the wilderness. But for 40 years, they've got to live day in and day out with the very people who stole the dream from them. They've still got to interact with them. 
Not only do they have to pay the price of the pain of divorce from the spouse that was unfaithful, they've now got to spend the next years figuring out, okay, how do we care for the kids together? Not only do they feel the pain of losing a job promotion, that, that they lost the job promotion because somebody else was lying and deceiving, and that person took the job. Not only they took the job, but they've now become your boss. Over and over, they told their kids, don't do this, do this, don't do that bad thing, do the good thing. And yet their kids still made the terrible decision, and now they've got to live under that terrible decision, and they've got to figure out, how do I have a good relationship with my kid? It's right up in our lives, isn't it? The story of Caleb and Joshua. How do I live with the people that we told we should go take this land, and now we've got to spend 40 years in a wilderness, and I've got to live with these people? After 40 years, that entire generation died off. The Lord called for another census in Numbers chapter 26. It's his way of saying, okay, let's try this again. They've all died. Let's see how many we got. Then you get the book of Deuteronomy. He goes through the laws again. Okay, let's get the laws straight again because we're about to go into the promised land. So let's do this over again. Moses is very old at the end of Deuteronomy because he disobeyed the Lord somewhere else. God said, you're not going to go into the promised land, but I'll let you see it. But I need you to appoint a new leader to take them into the promised land. And Moses appoints Joshua. Joshua is now going to be the leader to take them into the promised land. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies, and then we jump into the book of Joshua. Forty-five years. Forty years have passed. The first five years, the next five years, you read about in Joshua's chapter 1 through 13, and it's them taking the land. So after 45 years, where's Caleb? Chapter 14 of Joshua, verse 7. These are the words of Caleb coming to Joshua. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, The land on which your foot has walked shall certainly be an inheritance to you and to your children forever. Because you followed the Lord my God faithfully. And now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke these 45 years from the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I'm 85 years old today. And I'm still as strong today as I was on the day Moses sent me, as my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out just as the Lord has spoken. This passage moves me every time I read it because here's a story of somebody who remained faithful. Even though everything around him that he saw, he wanted to go a different way. But he said, I'll keep following the Lord. And so for 45 years, this man lived among the people that stole the promise from him. But here's what you've got to catch is verse 11 I am still as strong today as I was on the day Moses sent me, as my strength was then, so my strength is now, for war and for going out and coming in. Now, I've got to be honest with you. If I'm living with the people who stole my dream for 45 years, I can imagine the amount of bitterness, anger, hatred, and depression that would stir in me. And for 45 years, when you live with bitterness and hard-heartedness and depression, you can't say after 45 years, I'm just as strong as I was back then. 
But he was able to say, I'm just as strong. Why? Because he didn't live with the hatred and the bitterness. And for the last few minutes of our time, I want to share with you what I hope you will embrace is what I believe that helped Caleb survive these 45 years. The first thing is he pursued goals and desires that nobody else could steal. You see, the promised land was a dream for Caleb. He could imagine growing old there, raising his grandkids there. He could imagine it happening right away. But that goal and that dream could be taken away by anyone and everything. A job, a house, a relationship, a kid's future, a dream trip, all of these are things that could be taken away instantly, and we've all lived under that this last year with COVID and other things. People, events, and diseases can take away those kinds of goals. But Caleb had a goal that no one could take away. His ultimate goal, be faithful to the Lord. That was his main goal. In fact, the name Caleb means faithful as the Lord. Nobody could take away him being faithful except for him. The second is he followed God's rules for living regardless of of his circumstance. You see, God's rules didn't change. It's not a coincidence that right before this story we get the Ten Commandments because these are the rules that still apply to Caleb. No, they don't apply to me. They took my dream so I can act however I want. God says, no, they still apply to you. Can you imagine how many days Caleb walked through the camp and said, love the Lord your God, do not murder. Love the Lord your God. Do not murder. Love the Lord your God. Do not covet. Do you imagine how many days he had to do that? That is still my command. Jesus makes it easier for us. He took those Ten Commandments and he simplified them to two. To, to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. So how do you interact with the spouse that ruins your marriage? Love the Lord your God. And love your spouse. I don't know, Mitch. That's not my neighbor. They're my enemy. Okay, Jesus has got a word for that. Love your enemy. Yeah, but Mitch, every time I try and love them, they do something opposite. And everything I see in them is evil and mean. Don't trust what you see. Trust God's word. They stole the job I wanted. I'm just going to avoid them every day. I'm in the office. I'm just going to give them the cold shoulder. No, love the Lord your God and love your coworker. I've got a close friend who's in a men's group with me that a few years ago, he got demoted because of somebody else's deception. And he stayed faithful in loving the Lord his God and loving this coworker and others. He is still fully employed at that company and the other person is not. Can't get over the fact that COVID has stolen a dream trip. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. Are you passionate about a dream job? Okay, do it. Go after it by loving the Lord your God and your neighbor. Are you zealous about financial success? Great. Do it in a manner that loves God and loves your neighbor. Are you passionate about racial and gender equality? Great. Pursue it. But do it in a manner that loves the Lord your God and it loves your neighbor. You see, I believe in pursuing these. It doesn't set aside. We'd never get excuse to set aside these commands from God. The final thing that I think helped him survive is he realized that no circumstance changes God's promise. I made you a promise. These are your cookies. There you go. Enjoy. Someone else's decision made you have to wait. But God keeps his promise. No matter how long you have to wait, folks, be faithful to him. Follow his word over what you see. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you for Caleb and Joshua. Thank you for the story of these two men who said, regardless of whether the promised land is sitting right there or whether I've got to wait 40 years, 
My goal in life is to be faithful to you, Lord. Regardless of whether somebody stole my dream and my passion, my desires, my hopes, I don't have to live today as a victim, defeat it, but today my goal is the same. I can be faithful to you, Lord. So I pray that Caleb and Joshua would teach us how to love you, Lord, with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, and to love our neighbor, whoever they are, as I would love myself. May we stand and worship uh, out of that truth.
I don't know about you, but there are times I just need to hear encouraging stories of people who remain faithful because it's hard in these times uh, to just stay faithful. So I hope that the story of Caleb and Joshua gave you some hope that you can do this, that you can remain faithful, and I promise you the Lord will remain faithful to you. As we go, let me give you this word. To a God whose faithfulness is the same every day, his mercies are brand new every day, and his grace is more than enough to make it through today. May you serve him faithfully and wholeheartedly. Good to be with you, Lake Forest. Have a great day. If you guys, I know you might have to run, but you guys, if you give us like three, four minutes, we're going to try and get all of the...